Good evening, everyone. I'm Maggie Robe, the Marketing and Events Manager here at Flyleaf Books. Thank you so much for joining us to discuss the new book, After Jesus, Before Christianity, with two of its authors, Hal Tosik and Dr. Aaron Verncombe. Joining them is Sue Monk Kidd, who wrote the foreword to the book. We're having a bit of trouble bringing Hal into um, the Crowdcast platform at the moment, but I'm going to continue to work on that during the program, so hopefully he'll pop back up a little while into the discussion. If you have questions throughout the event, please put them into the chat or in the Ask a Question tab, and I will ask them towards the end of the evening. You can find out about all of our virtual events by clicking on the link at the top of the screen. If you'd like to support Flyleaf and tonight's authors, you can order your copy of After Jesus Before Christianity from us. Just click the green button at the bottom of this page, and I will put the link into the chat in a little bit. You can also call Flyleaf to order over the phone, or if you're local to Chapel Hill, come visit us and shop our shelves. We're now open seven days a week. And now I'd like to welcome our guest for tonight's events. Hal Tossig is a retired professor of New Testament at Union Theological Seminary in New York. He edited the award-winning A New New Testament and has published 14 books. His mediography includes The New York Times, Time Magazine, The Daily Show, People Magazine, Newsweek Magazine, National Public Radio, and The Washington Post. Dr. Aaron Verncombe is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto, appointed to the Office of the Dean. She received her PhD in a collaborative program at the University of Toronto between the Department for the Study of Religion and the Anne Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies. Her research specialty is the social origins and histories of Jesus movements in the first centuries of the Common Era, with a particular focus on practices of dress and embodiment. Sue Monk Kidd is the author of four New York Times bestselling novels, including The Book of Longings, The Invention of Wings, An Oprah Book Club Pick, and The Secret Life of Bees, which was adapted into a major motion picture and an off-Broadway musical. Her five books of nonfiction include Traveling with Pomegranates and The Dance of the Dissident Daughter. I'm going to minimize myself now and let our authors take the stage. Don't forget to put your questions in the tab for me to moderate later on in the evening. Thank you, Maggie. Well, I'm Sue, and I am so pleased to be part of this conversation tonight. Um, we're missing Hal, and I hope Hal can pop on soon. And I want to thank um, Flyleaf for sponsoring this. Flyleaf is a wonderful independent bookstore, and I hope you'll support them. So I was really honored, a little bit surprised, and very honored to be asked to write the foreword for this book. Um, when I read the manuscript, I was... Um, frankly, mesmerized by the discoveries and findings in the book. And I felt like they reshape a lot of what we understand to be the origins of Christianity. Um, when I was researching and writing my novel, The Book of Longings, which is set in the first century, I became aware of this gap. It's like a 200-year gap between the historical Jesus and the beginnings of Christianity. So, you know, what was going on? What was going on then after Jesus and before Christianity? And this book really takes that on. Um, and I, I feel like what it reveals is in some ways astonishing. Um, it's audacious, it's timely, and because of the historical narrative that we are accustomed to is so entrenched, we thought it would be useful to begin by talking about how to approach this book. And in fact, that was what I focused on as I was writing the foreword was how to, how to approach the book. So to that end, I'm going to read a five-minute abridged version of the foreword. You are about to read a book that possesses the potential to rewrite history, namely the long-held master narrative of how Christianity came to be. How do we perceive the founding story of Christianity? What really transpired in the first 200 years after Jesus? Did early churches exist in the immediate aftermath of Jesus? Did Christianity as we know it even exist in those pivotal two centuries? The questions are formidable and ultimately filled with hope. If I ask anything of you as you read the findings in these pages, it would be to not only allow the questions, but to love them. On Easter Sunday at the age of nine, I walked down the aisle of the First Baptist Church in my tiny hometown in Sylvester, Georgia, and I made what was known 
as a profession of faith. It was 1957, a long while ago, but that experience, along with an event immediately preceding it, occupy a prime piece of real estate in my memory. I was wearing a lavender dress, white gloves, Mary Jane shoes, and the piece de la resistance, a matching lavender parasol. There was something about that last accoutrement that filled me with both joy and spunk. Earlier that morning, sitting in Sunday school class, seized by a combination of boldness, mutiny, and unfettered curiosity, I had opened the parasol, revealing its magnificent purple canopy. The act was met by a sharp reproach from the teacher, and my beloved parasol was swiftly confiscated. Shortly after this small kerfluffle, I strode down the aisle without my contraband, where I was met by the minister, who asked me a series of questions. Do you believe Jesus died for your sins? Do you believe God raised Jesus from the dead? Will you repent and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? So began my religious life. It began in traditional religious orthodoxy, in the beliefs and doctrines of the Baptist Church of the 1950s in the American South. Yet hovering over it all was the lavender parasol, that small prophetic moment of testing boundaries. Throughout my adolescence and 20s, the orthodox master narrative that was passed on to me that Easter Sunday became my lens for interpreting life. But on the cusp of my 30th birthday, while reading a thin little book titled Letters to a Young Poet by René Rilke, I came upon this profundity. Try to love the questions. The words initiated me into the freedom of unknowing. I began to probe the givens and fixed concepts that had shaped me. I recovered the spirit of challenging sacrosanct boundaries. You could say, I got my parasol back. Whether your relationship to Christian religion is deep, shallow, past, present, or nil, the way you read this book matters. If you do so while loving the questions, it will plunge you into the freedom of unknowing it will allow you to acknowledge a multitude of conclusions previously thought to be impossible because they've existed outside traditional historical construct. It's questions that will save us. I invite you to open your purple umbrella and feast on this stunning reconfiguration of history and dream with me what it means for the future. Um, Aaron, it is clear to me that you and the other authors of this book um, love questions. Um, you approach this book itself as a big question, as an ex as I think you said, as an experiment. Tell us what led you to um, this particular approach. Thank you so much, Sue, and, and thank you for that beautiful lead off to our conversation this evening. I, I just love that image of opening the purple parasol. So after Jesus Before Christianity, the book is a product of the West Art Institute Christianity Seminars, incredible work over the past decade, work that's been built around this idea of as you say, Sue, of unfettered curiosity, of unlearning things that we think that we know, of unknowing. We've made so many assumptions about Christianity for so long. We've told the same story about Christianity for so long, how it began, how it developed, who the key players were, the key ideas. And in this book, we wanted to go back to the beginning and not just rethink these assumptions, but really undo them. 
but asking some really difficult questions like, are these figures as key as they've been made out to be? Who says this piece or form of evidence matters more than another? My co-authors and I believe that Christian history has been read and written backwards. So starting from our present moments and looking behind us, looking to answer uh, how we got here question and asking how we got here, that's a very particular kind of question, I think, because it reads us into that history. And it assumes our presence and our context as an end point. We, we wanted to take ourselves out of the question, out of the equation as much as possible, assuming nothing about what we know now about our present or future realities, and just trying to see what we can see when we're not looking for ourselves and things that we think that we know in the past. So really the experiment was to be as uninformed about our presence as possible. We found ourselves thinking a lot about history throughout this writing process, big questions about what history is and why we do history. Uh, as you do as well, Sue, so rethinking history, but in a very different context, in the context of fiction. And I think it would be really interesting for us to have this opportunity to kind of contrast what your approach to history was in the Book of Longings, also set in the first century, with our reimagining of, of history in the first two centuries of the Common Era. Um, you know, recently I saw a comment on social media about this event tonight, about the book. And it was from a woman who said, the history of the first 200 years of Christianity has already been written by the Catholic Church. So the implication being, it's already been written. What are you doing rewriting it or reimagining it? Um, so the question really does become, I guess, Aaron, what is history anyway? What is history? And is it a static body of events that happened in the past and it was written down and that's it, end of story? Or is history meant to evolve? And I guess I believe, and I, I assume the authors of this book believe that history really is a construction of a narrative that is based on the evidence that was available at the time and how that evidence was interpreted and um, who selected it and how it was selected and on and on and on. Um, the Book of Longings is a reimagining of history. I mean, it's been called a feminist revisionist history. It's been called an alternate history. Um, but essentially, I reimagined the story that Jesus was a single celibate bachelor and imagined the possibility that at some point he'd had a wife. And from the moment this idea struck me, uh, I felt the importance of imagining it because it provokes questions. It creates a kind of spiritual flexibility that we need. Um, the question essentially was, how would the Western world be different if Jesus had had a wife and she, this feminine presence, this empowered feminine presence was part of the story? How does reimagining past the past affect the present. That's really what engaged me the most. I'm wondering how you see the after Jesus before Christianity as a reimagining of history. Um, did, did this book change your relationship to the doing of history? Absolutely. I mean, once we once we decentered ourselves, once we tried to take the present out of the equation, I feel like the possibilities for seeing past realities just exploded and the possibilities for asking questions just exploded. Um, during the, the writing process, I had a particular quotation on my mind a lot, a quotation by a historical theorist named Beverly Southgate. Um, Southgate has many books, but in a book called Why Bother With History, Southgate compares 
poetry to history, which is a connection that I never would have thought of. And Southgate writes both, both history and poetry attempts to do the impossible, which is to express in static finite form, what is actually chaotically formless and an ever-changing flux. And that really became my kind of motto for the doing of history in, in this particular book. I feel like we want to, we want history to express or indicate some kind of solidity, something that we can identify and name with certainty. I mean, we're drawn to meaning, it's what we crave as human beings, but we've done a lot of meaning imposing on Christian history, again, as ways to find and reflect ourselves and our own experiences and understand our own place and places. We wanted to see what would happen if we were just drawn to that chaos and not pulled towards a circumscribed meaning. That was a huge change for me in the doing of history, this openness to chaos. And out of the chaos, I mean, came chaos to a certain degree. We found all of these new voices and new stories and the stories kept multiplying and multiplying in these really fantastic ways. It was the, the formlessness of the first two centuries, formlessness in terms of the intense diversity amongst these different Jesus groups and wisdom schools, supper clubs, communities of the anointed, all of these communities we discovered, this diversity allowed us to rethink evidence and what counts as evidence. And that's primary to the doing of history, right? It, it allowed us to rethink voices and narrators who gets to speak up in history, whose voices are heard, whose voices are not. And if chaos, I think chaos can also be identified with absence and emptiness, a, a darkness over the face of the deep, as you will. And, and our approach to history in this book was also identified in a certain way with absence, an absence of typical voices, for example. And one of the biggest absences in the book, which I think will be particularly surprising to readers, is the absence of Christians themselves. If, if Hal were here, I know that he'd love to comment on this absence of Christians. But I think what is key to this particular absence of, in the book is that the word Christian hardly exists at all in the first two centuries. The rare occurrences of the word don't represent a religion, um, but rather a rejection of or a resistance to Roman power. And we just found that these first 200 years of something other than Christianity, other than Christians, offer all kinds of people some real creative options for, for life, for communal life, for new practice. Um, so yes, out of this, uh, out of the chaos came a, a new kind of chaos, but a much more constructive one, I think, and one that's full of, of hope and diversity. Well, there, there may not have been Christians per se, named Christians during that 200 year period. But like you said, you had all of these interesting people doing all of these different things in supper clubs, these Jesus people, so to speak, some of them. Um, but they formed communities. They formed groups of belonging. And many ways, they, it did not include being Christian. That was, that was very surprising. Absolutely. And, and I think we have to remember, too, that, that they were doing this work, that they were finding these ways of, of being together, of belonging to and for one another in the context of the Roman Empire as well. And life under empire in the first two centuries was very, very difficult for the vast majority of the population living across the Mediterranean world. It was um, a world of a lot of violence. We don't tend to see this violence because what has come down to us in history is a, a lot of the um, empire's own propaganda about life under empire, which isn't to say that everything about life under empire was bad, but um, for a lot of people, it was it was pretty it was pretty challenging. Uh, different kinds of bonds were broken. There was a lot of migration happening, a lot of displacement of peoples, and and belonging to community became increasingly difficult. 
um, under this vast sweep of, of empire. I mean, you mentioned supper clubs before, and um, we might not think about Jesus people as meeting together in, in supper clubs to have boisterous meals and conversation, often accompanied by um, entertainment, songs, dancing, but more than anything else, um, if there is one practice that you could say unified these groups in the first two centuries, it would be this practice of, of eating together, of forming these associations um, under a common bond, which might be allegiance to Jesus, a wish to pay honor to Jesus. It might be a wish to honor the God of Israel. Um, it might have come out of a shared sense of displacement, might come out of a shared occupation. These are groups that came together to share meals in equitable ways, everybody getting an equal amount of food and just celebrating an ability to be together when conventional modes of being together were no longer available. And a really interesting mode of belonging for me personally was, was gender in this context and how gender was used as a means of negotiating belonging in the first two centuries. In gender then, it's a social construct then, as it is now, and as a social construct, gender did a lot of damage to human beings then as it continues to do now. And while there are resonances with gender in ancient Greece and Rome with our present contexts, it's important to recognize that gender and sex were constructed differently in the Roman Empire than now. One of the biggest differences being that ancient Greece and Rome operated under what's called a one sex model with the male body as the fully formed, complete or ideal body, and the female body as the imperfect, the imperfect incomplete body, kind of opposing poles on a vertical axis. And you could never reach the ends of the axis. You could never be a man. You're always working on becoming a man, but that work was absolutely essential to your social life in the empire. Male bodies sought solidity, definition, heat, structure, boundaries, and female bodies were the opposite. They were considered to be leaky, porous, at risk of penetration, <laughs> dangerous, because they had this kind of ongoing formlessness. They were always potentially transgressing boundaries. And what we see in a lot of the evidence that comes down to us from these groups in the first two centuries is this negotiation of boundaries a relationship to boundaries, boundary setting, boundary negotiation, boundary challenge. And in particular, they use gender to negotiate these boundaries. Gender, because it was about boundaries itself, I think became a powerful tool for these communities to think about and reimagine their identities in this shifting context of the Roman Empire. I could talk a lot about ancient theories of gender, and I don't think anyone wants to hear that. So I'm going to pass it back to you, Sue, because I, I feel like your work in Book of Longings interfaces with After Jesus Before Christianity really well in this context, because the main character, Anna, really pushes the boundaries of gender in order to find her place and identity in the world. And I, I really saw that kind of connection between both of our works. Yes, my character definitely does that. Although I could spend another half hour talking about how women are imperfect men. Wow. That one, <laughs> I, could, I could go on about that a while. Um, what made this, the gender bending in your book was so potent for me, um, particularly, I think of all the chapters that was enlightening and enlivening for me. Um, in, in my novel, The Book of Longings, Anna, who would become the wife of Jesus, uh, fictionally people, fictionally, um, represents what became lost in Christianity, in my mind. That's how I saw her. She was this female presence. She represented the feminine lens, the feminine uh, presence, the women's stories and um, voices. But she also represents what might have been if only we'd known, you know, it, it, she represents what is possible. So that's why I thought she was important. And um, Anna is living in a age very well, just like you described in the Roman Empire, in a hyper masculine time. 
she's gifted, she's ambitious, she's bold, she's got a heart full of longings. And what she wants to do is be a scribe and write the lost stories of women. And she inscribes her deepest longing as a prayer in a um, incantation bowl, which in part says, bless the largeness in me. When I'm dust, sing these words over my bones. She was a voice. So Anna is a boundary violator. Now, I got that term from your book. It's a term I loved because it describes the women in many of these, among these Jesus peoples, as you're calling them, it's hard to identify who they were because they were so diverse and there were so many different communities and strains of all this, but we'll just call them Jesus peoples, I guess. Um, but there were many boundary violators among them. And I think Anna says this at one point in the book. She says, it's her kind of awakening. She says, God, I discovered that God had relegated my sex to the outskirts of everything. Of course, it was not God, but their perceptions of God, I guess. Um, when I was in Ireland a few years ago, Ireland is just about my favorite country in the world to, to visit. And I visited the ancient monastic ruins of, of Glendalo, which was founded in the sixth century. And I was wandering around in the church ruins, but I was aware that there was this women's church there. And I wanted to see it, but I couldn't find it anywhere. So I looked at the map and it showed this inner enclosure of this Christian monastic city in the sixth century and an outer enclosure. And sure enough, the women's church was in the farthest outpost of the outer enclosure. I had to literally walk about half a mile and climb a stone wall to get to it. Um, now, why this struck me and why I'm bringing it up is because at the time I was reading about gendered spaces, which is this idea that um, space and geography can be arranged in such ways to preserve gender hierarchies. And I felt like I was walking around in a metaphor. Um, I mean, you had at the center of the city was the all male church and the male realm where authority and power and meaning making resided. And then way out on the margins, you had the women where there was very little power or, or participation really. And it was like I was seeing a metaphor of my religious history or I should say the codified history we understand that how Christianity came to be. What I was trying to do in my novel was rearrange the space in our imaginations. And what blew my mind was that in this book, you're rearranging that metaphor for real. And I find that incredible because you're moving the women from the margins back to the center um, in our understanding of the very earliest origins of Christianity. How we got moved out of the center back to the peripheries is a whole other story, I guess. But talk to me about what this book reveals about women's roles and leadership and the importance of in, this, in these early groups. Well, well, first, there's a lot of spatial reimagination that has to occur, that a total geographical remapping of this yeah. time period, because you know, certainly while uh, women had different relationships to different communities, certainly women were not at the outskirts. We are placing women at the center again. I mean, I think above all else, the the work in this book has revealed that there, there are no easy answers to these questions about gender boundaries and, and where we're locating um, gender within these communities. And I, I think that's important to recognize in and of itself that 
you know, in the past, we tend to ask questions like, for example, was the Apostle Paul supportive of women or were early Jesus groups supportive of women's leadership? And, and we discovered that those questions can't get us very far because the answer will be yes, and it will be no, and it will be both. That kind of binary approach to question asking won't work anymore. Were women present? Were they absent? Were they at the center? Were they at the periphery? Again, the answer is going to be yes and no and both. Because evidence from the first two centuries shows us that some of these groups conformed to and sought to reinforce prevailing gender norms, in some cases norms that would have placed women um, on the outskirts like Anna in private space, not in public space. But other groups experimented, played with gender, subverted prevailing gender norms in many cases. So it was used in really diverse and complex ways amongst these diverse and complex groups. And um, you know, there are all kinds of examples that I, I could give here, but for example, the group from which the writing One Timothy came, a writing that is now included in the canonical New Testament, but there's no canon or canonical imagination or New Testament in the first two centuries. So this writing really limits women's activities within the particular group for whom this writing was significant. Women's activities are policed, their bodies are policed. Women are told not just that they can't teach or lead, but that they're actually to remain silent. They're to dress and appear in a very particular way within the life of the community. They're to be subordinate to men in the community. But then we have a contemporary text like Gospel of Mary, a text that I just love. It's non-canonical. And the point here is not to contrast canonical with non-canonical, because again, those concepts are anachronistic in this context. We're just dealing with two writings that were important to probably two very different communities in the first two centuries. And we're holding these contemporary texts up as equal. And that's really important to this project. So very differently from First Timothy, Gospel of Mary doesn't describe Mary at all in terms of what she's wearing, what she's supposed to look like, which is such a relief to have a woman not described by her appearance. <laughs> she is identified instead in terms of her actions. She is a leader. She is a teacher. She is a seer. She's a very high status in the community. We're told that she's loved the most by the savior. And that's the designation for Jesus in this particular writing, savior. And the key teaching of the Savior in Gospel of Mary is actually that the community is to put on the perfect human. It's not a binary figure, not putting on the perfect man, putting on the perfect human, which is just such a powerful, powerful image. So we have these two writings, they're contemporary. Again, we're holding them up as equal because they were both important to two different communities, just in two different ways. So our evidence, again, just suggests that these groups were incredibly diverse. Um, another, a really wonderful example of a woman as a, a boundary violator and a woman who reminds me a lot of Anna is um, a woman named Thecla. There's another writing called, um, it's usually called Acts of Paul and Thecla which I don't really understand because Paul is not <laughs> the hero of this writing. It's really about Thecla. So let's just say acts of Thecla. I think that's much more appropriate. But Thecla, at the beginning of this writing, she's introduced in very normative gendered terms. And again, we're thinking about gender as a social construct and as a network of social relationships in particular. So Thecla is introduced as a daughter from a household with a, a patriarchal figure, the patriarch of the family. She's identified as a fiance. Um, she's about to enter into a heterosexual uh, marriage. She, so she's identified within this very gendered and structured family unit. And then she hears Paul teaching and her whole, her whole world is transformed. She is the 
ultimate boundary violator. She gives up these normative relationships in order to teach the good news of chosen family, very important in this context, um, as well as the dangers of marriage. Um, to the point where even Paul in this writing becomes really uncomfortable with Thecla's boundary violation and wants to distance himself from, from Thecla. So this is a much different approach than later post-Paul writings in which obedience to a father was a primary family model. Um, I think this is a really, Thecla's really, innovative proposal for spirit and, and courage. And she's also a great example of a voice that's been underrepresented in our doing of history, underrepresented in scholarship um, and underrepresented in our community practice as well up to this point. And I feel like if we work to hear voices like Anna's, hear voices like Thecla's in Acts of Thecla, more and more, if we include these voices in our conversations and our communities, there's so much potential for question and, and change. So we really wanted to, I guess I'm kind of diverting from, from gender here a little bit, but it is so central to so many of these writings. And, and by decentering the writings that only much later made it into the canon, because again, canon wasn't a concept people were working with in the first two centuries. When we look at all of these writings that were swirling and circulating around and the different groups that were drawn to and used these very different writings and told very different stories, I, I think we can really radically change our understanding, not of just of these early groups, but of our own potential for change as well, our own abilities to become boundary violators ourselves in some really powerful ways. We, we look a lot at these underrepresented voices, and um, you know, as I've as I've been talking, Thunder Perfect Mind is another one that comes to mind as, as having this transformative potential, potential to open ourselves up and and to see ourselves as as real voices and boundary violators as well. And I know that this particular writing has had a big impact on you, Sue, personally. Uh, as a writer, I think. I was really fascinated with the part of your book that addresses all these hidden writings that were circulating um, that are non-canonical, just an amazing amount of um, hidden documents that had real particular functions. Um, I've read and reread The Thunder Perfect Mind for 20 years. At this point, I don't even remember how I stumbled upon it that long ago, but it was really thrilling for me when I was reading After Jesus Before Christianity manuscript and I came upon the document. Um, it is a lengthy prose poem, I would say. Um, it, it was discovered in 1945, I believe, with the Nag Hammadi texts that were dug up in an Egyptian desert. and. It's in the voice, this is why it really um, touches me, I guess. It's in the voice of a powerful female deity, or at least most of it is. Um, there's a portion of it that I used for the epigraph to the Book of Longings. And it goes like this. I am the first and the last. I am she who is honored and she who is mocked. I am the whore and the holy woman. I am the wife and the virgin. I am the mother and the daughter. So you see these paradoxical identities and contradictions and wordplay go on and on in the um, poem. So actually, thunder, perfect mind, figures really prominently in my novel, not just as the epigraph, but I'm so struck by it that I put it in the story itself. Now, the author of the poem is unknown, but I took what's called a novelist um, prerogative and let my character Anna be the author of Thunder, Perfect Mind. And there's a scene in the novel where she recites it. She's just written it. She recites it for a group for the very first time. And as she does, 
she thinks, I feel all the women who live inside me. Now that's how I felt and feel when I read Thunder Perfect Mind. I feel all the women. I feel all the people. I feel all my selves. I mean, it's a very powerful and effective poem. Um, I'll just mention one other thing about it. As you can see, I'm very taken with it, but there is one line in the poem that has really taken up residence in me. And it is this, I am she who exists in all fears and in trembling boldness. I found and have found so much bravery in those words. And I love the idea that that was circulating in the first 200 years when there was so much chaos and, and crisis going on and so much suffering and these people coming together, trying Should to I, find comfort. You guys um, hear me? We can, hi, Hal, we can hear you and we can see you. Yes, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> we, we, we've missed you. Um, yes. But this is, the poem gave me the uh, paradox of trembling boldness, mm -hmm. which is essentially the idea that, you know, we can be bold in the midst of our fears. Mm -hmm. So I see the under perfect mind, which is one of the documents dealt with in your book and my novel as a kind of subversive document mm -hmm. um, meant, meant to dis disguise revolution, but at the same time, fuel revolution meant to inspire courage, meant to soothe heartache. So these are some of the functions, I think, of those hidden writings that were among the early Jesus groups. Could you say more about how, they're, how they functioned for these people? Absolutely. And, and I, th I think you're, you really nailed it when you said subversive documents. And as well, when you, when you point to Anna's performance, of the poem in the book because that that idea that that writings can do things that they're active that they have the power to change us not just in the the reading or the hearing but in the acting of them i think that really speaks to a, a point that we're looking to make in this book where we're we're trying to reimagine writings as not really writings at all in many cases. They're like sort of writings at best. We're not dealing with books here as we understand them or with processes of, of writing and reading as we're familiar with those. We're dealing with, with objects with or, or in writing that were much more dynamic and flexible in their circulation and, and use. I mean, there isn't a focus on reading and writing amongst the Jesus groups and clubs in the first centuries. Most people could not read or write. And we're finding that evidence that's been used in the past to emphasize that certain writings were of particular importance or particular prominence or central very early on, that evidence is now totally breaking down, um, showing no kind of, of unity, but rather uh, a diversity of different kinds of written things used for different purposes, some of which were subversive, um, some of which were celebratory, um, some of which, as you say, were to find strength and, and courage in very challenging times. So I've been really drawn to the activities of writing, the active roles of writings as material objects within community life and practice. Even writings that we might be more familiar with, like Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Mark is one of my favorite writings from the first two centuries. I don't think it was important as a book at all or something that was read at all. I think it was important as a material memorial. Maybe not in stone as a memorial, although I, I don't want to rule that out, but as a, a material thing that memorialized Jesus, particularly given the absence of Jesus' body and and the inability of a community to mourn a body in typical ritual terms. Um, something that has resonated with me now during COVID as well. How can we grieve when we don't have access 
many of us continue to not have access to conventional human modes of grieving, modes that we've had available to us for so, so long. That's something that I've really struggled with myself over the past year and a half. So we don't have a, a New Testament or a canon or anything like that, but we have these flexible written things, objects that that perform very different roles than we're used to within these groups. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's a really hopeful image for us. I think it opens up new potential for relationship to writing, to concepts like reading and books and and what books are and, and uh, why we love them so much. How I, I don't know how you're feeling at this point. I want you to, to I want to welcome you into the conversation. I'm Thank glad you. that you could uh, join been, us at this point. It's been time. great, great to listen to you all the whole time. Um, <laughs> but I'm happy to jump in. Um, um, but it's been it's wonderful to listen to you. I remember uh, you said a, a little bit earlier, Aaron. I could talk a little bit about Christians. Um, should I do do a little bit of that? But I wouldn't want to interrupt. Oh, you're not interrupting, Hal. Take it away. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, um, I'll do what I what um, uh, you suggested. So again, um, Aaron, as as you say, Aaron, uh, we really couldn't find any Christians in the first two centuries. Um, basically, the word itself hardly occurs. So um, uh, Christian as a word in those first two centuries has almost no meaning. Uh, I mean, just notice how much Christian does not belong to all the meanings um, of so many early Christian groups. None of the letters of Paul contain the word Christian at all. None of the gospels that eventually were in the New Testament contain Christian or Christianity. Well, the word Israel occurs 71 times in the eventual New Testament. The word Judean occurs 147 times. Paul, 169. The word Jesus occurs 1,002 times in the eventual New Testament. But of all the 138,000 words in the eventual New Testament, the word Christian occurs three times. In other words, all the important words in all, basically almost all of our, our texts um, don't contain um, Christian. Um, what our, one of the things that we realized as we came into the full recognition of that um, was we need to figure out what was developing in those uh, 200 words. In some ways, the news is, yes, there are no Christians. But our first challenge about these first two centuries was to ask who they were, since um, they didn't call themselves Christian. We discovered um, in the 10 years of researching and writing of this book, um, uh, there were a wide variety of creative, courageous, humorous, and smart groups among what they called themselves were things like the enslaved of God or the, the schools of the way or the order of, the, of Melchizedek or wisdom schools or anointed clubs, but no Christian stuff per se. These 200 years of what we were thinking about and you were talking about so clearly, uh, Aaron, um, uh, have something other than Christianity. Um, and, and what that is for today is also important, I think. Today, folks have some real ingenious options for spirituality and new religious yearnings in an era almost as, as long as the entire history of the United States. What has happened between, uh, happened um, are a greater variety of what I would say are religious, or excuse me, rebellious, inventive, sensitive, and vibrant movements and, and clubs 
not so much anti-Christian, but options for fusions and spiritual crossbreeds that opened up new possibilities um, as you really described so wonderfully, Aaron. So that's a little bit about um, no Christians and what what we began to untangle as what what is going on in that. I think this really leads us nicely to a consideration of the relevance of after Jesus, be, uh, before Christianity, and what we can take away from the book. Um, that is what kind of hope it gives us for the future. You just referred to that, Hal. Um, toward the end of the foreword, I suggested that there are parallels between the social crisis that were happening then um, and, the, and the crisis that we're experiencing in our world today. I mean, crisis of identity and belonging, of exile, um, immigration, immigrants, um, injustice, political oppression, the rise of authoritarianism, the rise of terrorism, um, the need for, for spiritual, new spiritual narratives and, and stories and women challenging boundaries. So I, I really can see the parallels and I think personally that Christianity seems to be at a turning point. I feel that there is a new paradigm that is really struggling to be born. And I found the book hopeful in that regard. Um, the revision of history allows us to reinvent how we think about and relate to Christianity. And it opens up all kinds of possibilities your book does. Um, I'm just going to ask both of you in a moment to maybe say a closing word or two before we take questions about the hope you see this book gives to you. And I'll just say, I want to quote the Jesuit scientist, Teo de Chardin, who wrote that we are the sum of our history. It's a quote that I kept on my desk when I was writing the Book of Longings. Um, because I think in a sense, our history holds our future. And we can't become what we can't imagine. So that gives me a lot of hope. I want you to speak to what gives you hope. Why don't you start I'll first? Finish. Yeah, Erin, why don't you start first? Okay, Erin, go. Well, that, that was so beautiful, Sue. Um, what gives me hope from this project? Um, it, it's very much actually along those same lines as um, you know, creating, creating space for ourselves to, to imagine new possibilities for, for life and especially for life in, in violent and very unstable times. The, the space that these groups were able to negotiate for themselves in their own violent and unstable conditions was really inspiring for me. I mean, to, to come back to gender in particular, um, some of these groups really dramatically disordered gender as a means of creating new space, new opportunity for life. They redefined typically gendered values, values like courage, which was a virtue considered synonymous with masculinity in this context, saying that someone was courageous was essentially calling them a man. And, and these groups are saying, well, that, that can't be what manliness is that can't be what courage is that's not acceptable that this version of it is not acceptable to us here these bodies that are socially excluded these persons that have been at the periphery these bodies these actions that's courage and that's subversive i i also found a lot of hope in in the work of rethinking the language that we use to to tell history to do history the vocabularies that we use to discuss the first two centuries and beyond. I mean, in some ways, writing this book was like inventing a new language. And I, I think this picks up on, on what you were saying, Sue, in, in that when we have more words, we have more opportunities for thinking. Vocabulary enlarges our thought, broadens it, enriches it, allows us to imagine new things. 
mean, we, we all know that our words matter so very much. And, and I feel like this book really tried to take the power of words seriously. And, and we're still working through the implications of language and language choice in this book. And there's still a lot of work to be done. But that work of, of creating new vocabulary and, and of redefining um, key words, words that were really key to social life in the first two centuries, words like courage, um, that's given me courage as well and, and hope for our futures. And, and I would just uh, briefly say uh, very similar things in, I think, two different ways. So, yeah, I, it seems like all of this new stuff that we discovered uh, in the first two centuries that hadn't been had, had much attention to it, um, it is, I think it's pretty likely that a number of those enterprises actually can bring some things directly to us in the 21st century, maybe about 40% or something. I don't know. But it, it, anyway, I think so. For instance, the way they um, transformed who they were together um, um, for um, when, when they got together with meal in, in meals and um, and uh, I think that kind of material can happen um, again uh, or in new ways. The other thing that I'm really taken with, Sue, is what you did. You really held up the kind of um, quality and um, I would say probably um, character of, of what was going on. So for instance, you, I quote you, you had, when you were, when you were a nine year old and had the parasol going, um, when you're going in to becoming a, a church member, you said something, uh, you said you had a combination of boldness, mutiny, and unfettered curiosity. Uh, and and I think that that's what was going on a lot in in the first two centuries. In other words, they were trying on all kinds of new parasols, and they didn't feel like they had to check in with anybody about can I wear the yellow one, um, or, uh, or can I wear the one with with uh, a little thing on the side hanging up. Uh, so that all of the all of that. Um, uh, I think um, is uh, more a character of of what they were doing, not the content always of what they're doing. Uh, and for for me, um, I think inventiveness um, was was a, a lot of what was really given. Um, by the scary and crazy things going on uh, in the violence of, of Rome. Um, so you, you, there were a lot more things more up for, gra up for grabs. Well, so let's let, let, let the other people talk. Huh? Yes, I, I'm interested in hearing what the audience wants to ask. Me too. Guys, mm -hmm. this is the book, and I hope you'll get it from... Flyleaf, Maggie, take it. You're going to do our questions, right? Okay. I am. So we have a few that have been posted into the Ask a Question tab. Um, so I will begin with this question um, that came in um, from Hugh. Was the development of the Orthodox Christian Church entirely due to the entanglement with Rome, or was it already developing and elbowing out alternative views during the first two centuries? Yeah, I, um, we um, I, we should both probably talk about that. I I think there was a little um, pushing things around, pushing people around. Um, it wasn't all uh, um, light and, and goodness. Um, there were things that were sometimes somewhat different, but there was no idea about somebody in charge. Very little idea of someone someone in some, you know, Rome or whatever uh, in, in charge. 
That simply hadn't happened yet. And the people who occasionally write in the first two centuries that they are in charge are the goofiest. I mean, they are the, the ones that don't seem to have much ch much charge at all and are t talking into thin air as far as uh, many of us can see. What do you think, Erin? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I mean, certainly some of these groups came to the attention of the empire in different ways and for different reasons. And, and we have some evidence of that. We have some correspondence between some local um, political figures and um, the Emperor Trajan, for example, talking about these parties of the anointed and what to do about these parties of the anointed. But, um, you know, even these local rulers really didn't know what to do because there was so much uh, diversity within these groups. So, um, you know, any any kind of uh, unity or, or organization, that's something that um, I think we need to talk about at a much later date. Hal, Hal, do you have anything else you want to add or shall I ask oh, the next question? Uh, let's go on and take some other ones. We might get back to that. It's not that okay. important. I mean, that is not very important. It's the it's the many different kinds of things going on. From Margaret, um, she said that many years ago she attended a lecture um, that said during the years after Jesus' death, there was a campaign for Jesus to be accepted as the Messiah. The thinking at the time was that Jesus would need to have performed miracles to be the Messiah. And so the Bible was written with many miracles, wondering if this is accurate. I'm not sure that I understand exactly what uh, is accurate, um, but let me take a, a run at it. Um, by and large, it, it, uh, um, it seems to, to me that the stories and visions of, of in the writings or the sort of writings of the first 200 years are imaginative. They're, they're not wrong. They're just uh, often images that can help people or get people to someplace else. So to think of, of those writings as, as history is simply not what they wanted it to be thought of as. Um, and so I, I would encourage you um, in this question, if I understand it correctly, uh, I would encourage you to, to read those stories, not as something necessary that happened, but that was a way of, of helping people see life differently. A and question from Darlene that Beth was also interested in talking about. Darlene asks, I'm wondering where the presence of Mary Magdalene as the first apostle fits into this conversation and history. Well, I've, I've done a lot of th stuff on, on, on Mary Magdalene, especially the Gospel of Mary. I'll start, and but Aaron, I know, has also got lots to say. So um, it it's, seems to me that uh, in the Gospel of Mary, which I, uh, which we talk a lot about in the book, and the the Gospel of Mary, please go read it. <laughs> we this has been discovered in less than a, a hundred years ago, basically, and it's an amazing document. Um, uh, so yes, that demand that should demand our attention. We should. It has so much beauty and so much power in it. It has a picture of a woman, a woman in charge that says Jesus liked her better than everybody. And that doesn't seem to be about sex. That's about um, the, in, the uh, ideas she has and the leadership she has um, among communities. Uh, so yes, there, it would be hard to say that it would be a mistake to go after what Mary Magdalene offers to a contemporary people, not just Christians, but a bunch of different ones. Gospel of Mary really is an important writing in our book. And 
again, to, to go back to uh, what Sue was describing earlier about this, um, not just metaphorical organization of space, but uh, organization of, of space that quite literally reflects um, social structuring and, and social thought. I mean, Mary in Gospel of Mary is, is at the absolute center of this community. She is the teacher, she is the leader, she is described as the one that the Savior loved best. Um, and again, that's primarily in terms of her, that's, that is in terms of her community activity, her, her leadership. Um, so if, if you're interested in Mary Magdalene, then Gospel of Mary, uh, definitely the text for you. I mean, I, I should say full disclosure that um, Mary Magdalene is the whole reason why I became interested in biblical scholarship and um, religious scholarship in the first place, uh, discovering Mary at the end of Gospel of John. Um, I, I could talk a lot about that. It, it was a very specific moment in a very specific classroom in my undergraduate days. Um, and that one experience of that writing um, led me down this particular path of becoming uh, a scholar of, of the study of um, ancient religions. So I'm totally there with you about centering Mary Magdalene in our discussions. Sue, Sue, do you want to say something about that? No, I'm going to let you two scholars answer those questions. But no, I, I have a, a fondness. I read the Gospel of Mary as well. And I agree with what you're saying about the centrality and how powerful she is right at the heart of things, making symbol, making meaning. I mean, it's very in, it's um, empowering, I think, for all of us to see that. Another question um, about non-canonical texts. Can you suggest, the author suggest other non-canonical texts to work with? <laughs> did, that, did that person um, uh, pay somebody to ask that question? <laughs> I'll start with that. Um, uh, but I'm not at all the, uh, a person that um, is, uh, is the only person that, a whole bunch of, of uh, scholars are really going at that. I um, did uh, about seven years ago, write a major book called A New New Testament, um, in which um, 20 different scholars and uh, per, um, religious leaders from across the country spent um, a, a year with me studying 76 of the new texts discovered in the over the last hundred years. And uh, Houghton Mifflin and Harcourt, to name another publisher, allowed us then to choose what these leaders in, in American religion, which 10 they thought should be added to a new New Testament. Um, so there, um, just take a look at that if you if you want. It's it's all around and 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 it has um, it has it. We we talk about the ten we chose, um, which included um, Thunder Perfect Mind, um, and uh, the, we talk about the thing the ones we didn't. I'm gonna I'm gonna put in a little plug here for a very particular writing called On the Origin of the World. Um, if you haven't read that one, very highly, highly recommend. It was also discovered among the uh, Nag Hammadi corpus of texts. And it's a, a retelling of Eve's story. And Eve's voice is so powerful and restorative in this text. Um, one of our, our colleagues at the Western Institute, Celine Lilly, has done really excellent work on, on this particular writing. If you're interested in finding new and powerful voices on the origin of the world, give that one a read. All right, I have another question um, from the chat. I have, I have two good questions. I think it'll be our last two questions since it's 7.15. I think that folks have been been listening for a while, very intently. Um, from Megan, we have, do you think the mutinous transgressive way that these communities lived was a result of how Christ lived his life? 
Um, that's the same thing as the uh, the answer there, um, as Aaron's answer about 20 minutes ago is yes, no, and sometimes. <laughs> um, uh, so yes, keep on thinking out, uh, about and with Jesus uh, all the time. Um, but remember, as I as I said earlier, please don't think of that as um, as simple relationships. Um, uh, um, it didn't, a lot of what happened, especially wonderfully in these first two centuries, is a whole bunch of other people started writing and thinking alongside of, instead of, right, right with, and sometimes very different than Jesus. And sometimes they wrote all of that in Jesus's words, meaning they made up words or they invented words that said it better sometimes, I would say, and, and they would have said that some of you might not. I'm going to, before I uh, close this out, I want to ask one question that um, Toto posted here. He says, thank you all very much. Aaron mentions in the book that the next experiment is where do we go from this? Can you give us a clue? <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to close out our discussion tonight. So, so stay tuned. There's, as you know, there's so much more work to be done. And the Western Institute's Christianity Seminars is moving into phase two. So new research is happening right now. Um, and we're really looking forward to um, producing a work that's going to focus on the next couple of centuries. So we're continuing to ask these questions. We're, we're continuing to try to practice our unfettered curiosity, um, our trembling boldness about asking these questions. We're, we're trying to ask new questions and to really love these questions. So um, the questions are ongoing. The work is happening right now. And, uh, and you'll see more. You'll see more from us in the future. And, and I would say the, the cool thing about the next stage is that um, we and you all uh, get to use the word Christian more um, uh, and see how many different meanings that has. And, and, the, and the opposite of that, of course, is one of the really freeing things that happened to us is that we were required not to use the word Christian in as much as we wanted to really see what was happening in um, in those first two centuries. And, and that was such a, a gift. Well, if anyone, the authors have any other final comments or things that they, statements they wanna make before I, I close up the program, feel free to have a word. Sue, do you have something you'd like to say? Well, I just wanna thank these two scholars for letting me be part of their conversation. I'm really honored by that. And I, I can't recommend the book enough. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sue, for, for being a part of this book, for um, your incredible work on the foreword, um, for the ongoing conversation. I also want to thank Flyleaf for hosting us tonight. I've really enjoyed this conversation and I hope all of those who have been listening so um, politely and, and attentively, I, I hope that you all enjoyed it as much as I did. This was a lot of fun. So, so thank you, Sue, and thank you, Flyleaf. Um, thanks, Maggie, for hosting us tonight. This was really a great experience. And we're glad you popped in, Hal. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just for one of the things that Sue and I are talking ongoingly about is that wonderful dimension of how fiction and and writing history is so close together. So please read as many books of hers and many fiction books as possible um, uh, to help get to the truth. Thanks. Well, that's wonderful. I'm going to um, wrap up tonight's talk and say thank you so much to our authors for, for their perseverance with getting 
the technology to work and coming online for this fascinating discussion. Um, please, we have recorded the event. It will be on our Crowdcast platform immediately following this, so you can rewatch and share with people. Um, and then it will, it will be on our YouTube channel next week. Um, keep an eye out for other upcoming events in our newsletter and our website. And please support our authors and our store by purchasing a copy of After Jesus Before Christianity from us. And thanks again to everyone and good night. Good night. Good night.